sleep And every single step I take there Every day I can be your light unto the world Lord, you are my everything. You are our everything. You are a great God and greatly to be praised. But Lord, you've also given us the promised Holy Spirit. And we're so thankful for the fact that the Holy Spirit has committed to stay here with us on earth. Thank you. Thank you. And Lord, we want more. We want more. We want more. We thank you for the privilege of living in such a time as this in this world. We thank you, God, that there are not only signs, but it's happening. This third great awakening, it's already begun. And we just give you praise and all the glory. And Lord, we know that you have not forgotten us, but we will not let up in our praise. We will not let up in our worship. We will not let us let up on reminding you that we need you. And you are everything, and we are nothing without you. And Holy Spirit, we need your grace. We need your strength. We need your counsel. We need your comfort. We need your power every day. And we not only need it for us personally, Lord, we need it so this world may be saved. That this world, would, that heaven would be full and hell would be empty. 
for such a time as this because you have ordained it. This is a new era. And I thank you, Father, because we start this new era with God. And God goes before us. He is with us and behind us. He is our strength. He is our hope, our grace, our peace, our purpose. We are nothing. We are the glove. And Lord, you are the hand. And, uh, or is it the other way around? Forgive me. <laughs> Forgive that wrong. Or I'm not even sure. But Lord, you know what I'm saying. And you are everything. And we want you. And we welcome you. And we wait. And we wait. And we know we will not be disappointed. We never have been. We aren't now. And we never will be. Because like we shared earlier this morning in prayer, God, the show that you're putting on in these days is bigger and better than anything we've ever known. Yes. And it's going to be in the church, and it's going to be in the world, and nothing will be exempt from this move of God. And we praise you, and we welcome you, Jesus. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue worshiping together, but don't you appreciate his presence? Um, I think the more I follow him, the more I appreciate his presence and value it. And uh, a couple Sundays ago, I had... Uh, I had Lindsay read scripture and I was standing up to the side and I just felt the anointing of the Lord and I thought, Lord, what? Am I supposed to put the sermon aside today? What are you doing here? And I felt like I was supposed to just go ahead and, and speak. But uh, the Lord is here in power and this is a day that we remember when His Spirit was poured out and when His Spirit comes, um, it's ferocious. It says there wasn't just a, a gentle breeze, the sound of a gentle breeze. No, it was the sound of a violent wind that came. He's, and it was fire. It came in fire. And you know what fire does? It burns out the impurities. And uh, I think if we ever needed in the church to have the impurities burned out and to be holy as he is holy, as the scripture says, it's today. Amen. In a day when the Bible is even considered to be hate speech, are you kidding me? We need we need the fire of the Holy Spirit that we might accurately represent His Word to this world. And so uh, we're going to sing a couple songs. And if you'd like to come and just kneel and worship, the Scripture says we can kneel and worship. You can come and just kneel and be in His presence if you want to sing as you kneel. Uh, but we just want to invite you to come as we sing.
morning church family uh, on this Memorial Day weekend welcome and if you're a guest you're especially welcome I'm glad you decided to join us and uh, we just want to take a minute this morning to remember all those that have served in the military in our country to uh, that gave their lives for the freedom that we enjoy and frankly we I think too often take for granted and uh, Words aren't enough to say thank you to those that have given their lives and to remember them today. We remember them today. Well, would you like to look in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1? I'm starting a new, I think it's going to be a series, we'll see. But um, on the book of Galatians, I like to just go old school every once in a while and just do a, a, a excuse me, a, a sermon on a whole you know, book of the Bible. Galatians has, I think, six chapters, so it could be a six-part series. Well, we'll see. I'm, I'm uh, going to take it as it comes. But Galatians chapter 1, 
And you can follow along as I read. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and from all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Now, Galatia was, I learned this week, was not actually a city. It was more like a region. It'd be like saying, hey, this is for the all the churches in the, you know, the Hudson Valley region, I suppose. Verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Um, just need to mention, one of the ways that letters were written in Paul's day was they began more like we would end, right? They began it by, by saying, hey, I'm Andy and grace and peace to you. And they would give a greeting and then they would write the letter. So that's what you just heard. So verse six says, Paul says, I am astonished, right? He just like launches into this. I, I, I don't want to call it a rant, but he launches into this passionate uh, 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 speech, I guess you could say. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, we'll stop there, but keep your book open. We're going to come back to this. Uh, let's jump right into this. Number one, there is only one gospel. There is only one gospel. It's almost like Paul is saying, I, I'm astonished. Like he says, let me read it again. He says in verse six, I'm astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. Right? I'm, it's like he's saying, I'm astonished. I'm astonished that you're not more rooted and grounded in your faith and that you really don't know what you believe. Or it's as if he's saying, you know, in today he might say, I'm astonished that you're so easily distracted from Christ. Or I'm astonished that you hear, uh, to hear that you are being discipled by social media and what, pe what is being promoted as right by people who are not even believers in Jesus. Or I'm astonished that you would allow the culture around you to dictate what you believe as it relates to morality and what's right and what's wrong. Today he might say, I'm astonished that as a church, Pete Scazzaro would say, I'm astonished that you're only one mile wide and less than an half an inch deep. I'm astonished at the shallowness. Or he might say today, I'm astonished that you are acting like thermometers. All right, that's an illustration I've used several times. Thermometers become like the environment around them. All right, whereas uh, it's like he's saying, you know, some churches have been so desperate to be relevant to the culture, and we should be concerned about being relevant to the culture, you, but you can become so desperate to become relevant to the culture that they become like the culture and therefore have become irrelevant to the culture as far as making any difference for eternity. And, and that's, that would be a, a thermometer. He said, it's like, almost like he's saying, you've become like a thermometer. You've become like the culture around you. you you've, okay, or he could have said that. Uh, of, course, of course, a thermostat influences the environment around it. It's like he's saying, I'm, a th I'm astonished that you are making the gospel more about you than about Jesus. And he says, there's only one gospel. Galatians 1, 7 from the Amplified Version. Listen to this. It says, there are obviously some people masquerading as teachers who are disturbing and confusing you with a misleading, counterfeit teaching. And I want and want to distort the gospel of Christ, twisting it into something which it is absolutely not. I love the Amplified Version. In a recent article I, I read by Kerry Newhoff, podcaster, uh, he said, the popular narrative of the West, Western world over the last 30 or 40 years has been that religion is poisonous. Now, this is an example of how the gospel is being distorted to look like something that it's not. All right, so the popular narrative of the Western world over Western world over the last 30 to 40 years has been that the religion is poison as the famous atheist Christopher Hitchens used to argue that religion creates war and atrocity, judgmentalism and racism, intolerance and ignorance across the populace. Images of people denying science, hating others, doing violence against people rule the day. 
Well, a guy named Rodney Stark is one of the most celebrated and respected sociologists of religion in the world. He explores several areas using America as a microcosm example of the West at large. Now listen to this. Here are his conclusions. Religious people, now we're not just talking about people who know Jesus, we're just talking about religious people. Pretty broad category, okay? But here's what he says. He says, religious people are the primary source of sec secular charitable funds that benefit victims of misfortune, whatever their beliefs. He says, religious people dominate the ranks of blood donors and other pro-social behaviors. He says, religious people are much less likely to commit crimes. He says, religious people are far more likely to donate their money and time to socially beneficial programs and to be active in civic affairs. The impact of religious people on volunteering alone is an estimated $47 billion, $47 billion annually in the U.S. alone. All right. And Paul is saying, hey, this gospel is being perverted. You're... you're People are trying to make you think something is true that is not. And he goes on. Religious people enjoy superior mental health, are deemed happier, less neurotic, and far less likely to commit suicide. And by the way, this isn't just like his opinion. This is thorough research, not just based on some video he saw on YouTube or some kind of Facebook ranting, all right? This is a legitimate uh, research that has been done. He goes on. Um, Religious people enjoy superior physical health, have an average life expectancy more than seven years longer than that of ir the irreligious. He says, religious people read more than their irreligious friends and neighbors. They are less likely to believe in the occult, UFOs, Bigfoot, etc. Are apt to marry, less likely to divorce, and report higher degrees of satisfaction with their spouse. He said, religious husbands are far less likely, less likely to abuse their wives or children. This is, of course, contrary to the story that it, religions create systems of oppression in the home because of male patriarchy. Religious fathers are more likely to be involved in youth-related activities such as coaching, sports teams, or leading scout troops, etc. Religious couples enjoy their sex lives more. Sex happens, sex happens more often. They are less far they are also far less likely to have an affair. Religious people, uh, religious students perform better on standardized achievement tests, are far less likely to drop out of school, obtain better jobs upon graduation, and are far less likely to be on unemployment. He goes on, religious people in 247 studies done between 1944 and 2010, uh, religion has a positive effect on society in regard to crime, deviance, and delinquency. Crime rates in the U.S. compared to the decidedly less religious countries of Western Europe are glaringly less in many categories. He goes on, urban stats going from present day back to the 1920s show that the higher a city's church membership rate, the lower its burglary, larceny, robbery, assault, and homicide rate rates. And Paul, I hope you kept your book open in verse 7, he says, evidently some people are trying to throw you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And he says, there is only one gospel. Well, Paul gets pretty stern. He goes on. This isn't like a, you know, oh, is it nice that you're Part of the church. This is a, a re boy, this is some stern stuff from Paul. Verse 8, he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, boy, oh boy, here he comes. He lets them have it. He doesn't hold anything back. Here's what he says He says, Let them be under God's curse. <laughs> he, Paul writes with an urgency here. He goes on in verse 9. He says, As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? And he says, if I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Let's pause there. Why? Wow. Let me take a breath. Whoa, easy, Paul. You know, wow. Uh, you know what? We all know how to please people, don't we? I've even heard of people that are addicted to pleasing people. Joyce Meyer read a, wrote an amazing book called uh, Approval Addiction. We want people's approval. We all know about this. 
When I think of pleasing people, I think of customer service. Any business owner understands customer service. You know, um, you don't start a, a, a conversation off with a potential customer by saying, now listen, before we talk, here's a list of the 25 things that I'm going to expect you to do if you're going to buy my product. No, that's not what you do. You know, the spirit of the customer is always right. All right, the spirit of it is you'll bend over backwards to do whatever you can to accommodate the customer because he's going to buy your product. And so you, you know, you don't wait three weeks to return his call, right? You don't leave his message just sitting on the answering machine. You return it as quick as you can. Uh, you want to get back to him because he may buy your product. And if he wants to, you know, some references, you point him to some references. And if he wants to meet in person, you try to accommodate his schedule, right? That you know how to please people, customer, it's all customer service. And anybody with a successful business understands the importance of taking care of the customer. Now, however, here's the deal. If we're not careful, we will bring this kind of thinking into the church and we will take it too far if we're not careful. There's a good aspect of it, but we can easily take this too far. The customer is always right. The attender is always right. The volunteer is always right, or the board member, or the ministry team leader, or the ministry team member. Now, that's a little bit, what's a little bit scary about what I'm saying is it's very possible that some of you right now listening to me are like, well, well, yeah, that, sh that sounds reasonable. Shouldn't the attender always be right? Well, that is scary because even though scripture is clear, scripture is clear about things like morality, character, lifestyle. We can't go around saying, well, well, whatever the attender wants. You know, if you, if you go down that road, it's a slippery slide away from the gospel and pretty soon you have no gospel. All right, and that's what Paul is, is warning them about. And that's what he's, he's calling them on. Doing what Christ wants us to do will sometimes be pleasing to people. Sometimes what Jesus said, boy, when he fed the 5,000, you can bet people love Jesus. Man, Jesus, well, the miracle worker, we all had our fill. But then there were other times where Jesus didn't please people at all and everybody abandoned him and he turned to his disciples and was like, well, what are you, are you guys going to leave me too? And you know, that's where I think it was Peter that uttered the response, where else can we turn? Look with me at verse 10. A little kind of a Bible study here. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? And he says, if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul seemed to think that what Christ wanted was more important than what people wanted. It reminds me of this change of strategy that the Lord boy, I'm going to say put on my heart, really convicted me of, I, 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 guess, I think I could say that. And a change of strategy a, couple, strategy a couple of years ago in terms of my approach and what I believe is to be our church's approach to ministry. And the change is, I've said it many times, that we are now, for a long time, we tried to attract people. All right, our hearts were good. And I think we did. I think we attracted people pretty well and some good things happened. We have lots to celebrate, lots to praise the Lord for. But you know, you can take that too far to the, to the extent where you're not just attracting people, you're just pleasing people. And it reminds me of God just changing my heart and saying, Andy, how about you attract me as your first priority and let me attract people through you. When you can get in touch with me, then I'll attract people. That, that won't be a problem. Hmm, attracting his presence first before people. Christ is always right. And Paul says, and there's really just one gospel. It reminds me of the McDonald's slogan. There used to be the old song, um, you, you're the one, you are the only reason. It's a whole ditty that McDonald's came up with years ago. And their slogan is, we do it all for you. And of course, that's customer service. That's a good slogan. McDonald's is a, a massively uh, successful company in the world, really. But for the Christ follower, no, it's not we do it all for you. It's actually we do it all for Jesus. You could add on to that who did it all for you. But we'd first do it all for Jesus. Well, the message of the gospel is the opposite, that the customer is always right. In the case of the gospel, the customer is not always right. 
There's only one gospel. Look with me at verse 15. Just, just track with me. Don't, don't turn, turn, turn me off here. Verse 15, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, Paul is saying this, so that I might preach him. What was Paul saying? Paul was saying, my ministry, my ministry is about connecting people to Jesus. And if, if you connect to me, great, but I want you to connect to Jesus. Do you know that the anchor became a key Christian symbol during the period of Roman persecution. And a singer, Michael Card, said that the first century symbol wasn't actually the cross in the first century, it was the anchor. And if I'm a first century Christian and I'm hiding in the catacombs and there, uh, you know, three of my best friends have just been thrown to the lions or burned at the stake or crucified and set ablaze as torches at one of Emperor Nero's garden parties, the symbol that most encourages me in my faith is the anchor. And when I see it, I'm reminded that Jesus is my anchor. And it reminds me of Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. This is, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It's like Paul is saying, I'm feeling a little shaky and insecure to hear that you would even consider a different gospel or a distorted or twisted gospel. If I had a million dollar boat, if I had a million dollar boat, I would need an unlimited credit card to pay for the fuel and to cover the expenses of the boat. Anyway, if I had a million dollar boat, if I'm gonna anchor my million dollar boat to something, I wanna make sure it's firm and secure. Well, I don't have a million dollar boat. However, I do have a million dollar family. In fact, my family is worth a whole lot more than just a, a little million dollar boat. My biological family, not to mention my church family, and if I'm going to anchor my family to something, I want to make sure that it is firm and secure. Psalm 119 verse 61 says, Evil people try to drag me into sin, but I am firmly anchored to your instructions. What are you anchored to today? Are you anchored to the government? I'm thankful for the government, but I'm not anchored to it. Are you anchored to social media or the apprentice? opinions of your friends or your family or are you anchored to your work or, or something like pornography or or some kind of addiction pleasure food are you anchored to your boyfriend or girl, girlfriend or your spouse or are you anchored to like drugs and alcohol and food you know and the list goes on and on it's like Paul is saying there's only one gospel and I'm anchored to it and I want to stay anchored to it and I want you to stay anchored to Christ because that's where you're going to be safe that's where you're going to be firm. That's where you're going to be secure. And so he's pretty passionate about calling them to not accept any other gospel. There's only one gospel. Number two, Jesus gave himself for our sins. Galatians 1 verse 4, uh, again, it says Jesus gave himself for our sins. It says just that. And in Christ, the customer... All right, if I could use those business terms again, bear, bear with me. In Christ, the customer or the attender is not actually always right. However, the customer is always extraordinarily valuable and loved. The amazing thing is that as the business owner, before Jesus even knew if we, the customer, would buy into his product, the gospel, he totally paid for it in advance and the cost was extraordinarily high. The cost was his life. Jesus became the sin offering on, on our behalf and on behalf of mankind. Salvation from sins came as a result of the price Jesus paid on the cross. Jesus faced the rejection of the crowd. He was mocked, he was stripped, he was beaten, he was scourged. He was faced the agony of the, and the pain of the crucifixion. He hung on the cross and cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and then in John 19, verse 30, it says, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Everything he faced, he faced for us. Everything he faced, he faced for me and for you. You can put your name in there. Everything he faced, he faced for Andy, for Bill, for, for Sue, for Dora. You too, Alan. Look with me at Isaiah 53, which I'd love to have you turn there. 
more and more I want people to turn to the scriptures on their own and not just look on a screen. Because I want you to be familiar with it. These are This is a, one of my go-to scriptures. I hope it will become that to you as well. Isaiah 53 verse 3 says, referring, it's a prophecy referring to Jesus. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up, okay, here it is. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. All, he did all that for our benefit. Pause, pause for a minute and just take that in for a minute. The attender, the church member, the person in the community is, is not always right when it comes to following Christ, but they're always loved. And God's goodness is always, we, we sing a song that says it's running after us. And let me ask you, does this sound like hate speech to you? There's an old song we used to sing probably decades ago now. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus willingly came into a world that would hate, reject, and crucify him, and, and even twist the truth. And No greater love has ever been shown than what Jesus did for me and what Jesus did for for you. Maybe you just need to be reminded of that today. First John chapter 3, 16 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down, there it is again, he laid down his life before he knew whether we would respond or not. Before we, he knew whether we would accept his product, the gospel or not. He said, but I'm going to, I'm going to just totally pay for it. All I'm requiring you to do is just turn and accept it and receive it and turn from everything else because I, I, I just want you for myself. Jesus gave himself for our sins. Why would, why would he do that? Galatians 1.4 says Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Jesus gave himself our sins. Number three, Jesus came to rescue us from evil. Now, in other words, we can't deliver ourselves from this present evil world. We need rescuing. We can't do it ourselves. One of the themes that we are probably going to get into in Galatians is the idea that we, we can't work ourselves into you know, to heaven. We can't earn it. It's not like a legalistic thing. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. It's one of the things we're going to get to. Our job is to open the door. Now, there's a Facebook posting I, I, I happened on uh, this week. It's uh, just a, like a one-minute clip by my brother-in-law, uh, Dan Lamas. But here's what he, the gist of what he said. If I had the clip, I'd show you. But here's the gist of what he said. The Lord showed me in a picture of my life. He was talking about the, the Lord now, the, the, the Holy Spirit, actually. He said, the Lord showed me a picture of my life like a house with a flood rushing through the hallways of my life i felt like the holy spirit said to me every door you open i'm going to flood that room you won't have to do a thing except open the door all right he's seeing kind of a, a sounds like he's seeing kind of a vision or like a picture that the lord shows him and he says i was struggling with god's desire for me somebody might relate to that right now you're struggling with the idea that god would ever like desire you because he said I thought I had to desire him I realized he cannot wait for me to open the doors he wants to rush in and of course I said you mean that room that I'm ashamed of you mean that closet that I don't even want to go into and he said yeah that one 
You don't even worry about cleaning it up. Just open the door. And Dan says, the Lord said, I'm going to change everything. Let me say that last part again. He said, you don't even worry about cleaning it up. Just open the door. I'm going to change everything. See, we think that's one of the messages of Galatians. We think, well, we've got to change everything and then we'll be worthy of God's son, Jesus. And Paul corrects that. He said, that's no gospel. That's, that's getting into religion. That's getting into the very thing that Jesus came to take care of and to save us from trying to save ourselves. Well, Galatians 3, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit now. Verse 2 says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. All right. Again, Paul is, is pretty stern. I, you know, three chapters later, you think he would have calmed down a little bit, but he says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing in what you heard? Right. Or by opening or by opening the door. Right. That's kind of what he's saying. Verse three he says, are you so foolish? Boy, he, he holds nothing back here. Are you so foolish? Somebody needs to hear this today, perhaps. Look, are you so, I mean, it's not my words, it's, it's God's word through the Apostle Paul. Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to work your way to heaven and somehow earn God's favor? You can't. You can't do that. And he says, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Verse 4, have you experienced so much in vain? If it really was in vain. So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard what you heard or in other words does he work in your life by all the works that you do or by the fact that you open the door the invitation this morning is not to try harder or to beat yourself up for failing at something in your past we've probably all done our, our share of that I suspect I have but the invitation this morning is to simply open the door of your heart and, and cooperate with what the Holy Spirit wants to do he wants to clean you up your job is just to cooperate in fact the Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice to obey is better than a big church obeying might result in a big church it might result in a small church. That's not the point. The point is obeying. It says it's better than sacrifice. Obeying is better than doing a bunch of stuff that God didn't ask you to do. Right? It, well, you're doing all that stuff. I think sometimes, for me, sometimes when I was doing a bunch of stuff, God's like, okay, that's nice. That's You're keeping busy, but why don't you do what I want you to do? Right? To obey is better than sacrifice. Allow the Holy Spirit to control you. There is no, Paul says, there is no other gospel. There's no one who's going to love you like Jesus. There's no one who's has so passionate for you. What's the Holy Spirit? What is Holy Spirit saying to you today? The question is, will you obey? Will you respond? Father, I bless all who are taking this in today. Let there be response today. Lord, we need more than information. Information is, we can get tons of information more than ever in the history of the world, Lord, we have access to information, but Lord, we need revelation. Reveal to us what you want us to do right now in this moment. While in front of the laptop, in front of the phone, in front of the TV screen, wherever this is being watched, Lord, reveal to us what you want to do. And Lord, help us respond because you want only good for us. You want the best for us. And you want us to serve the gospel that is the true gospel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me today. God bless you. Stay on the winning side. Stay with the one gospel. Would you raise your hands for the benediction? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever, ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And everybody said, now go and be the church.